But I don't, I really don't have any regrets. I really don't. I've, I've lived exactly how I've wanted to. I've tried my hardest every single time. I didn't win the matches that maybe I should have always won. Or, but I really gave it my all. So that for me is enough. Hi everyone, uh, welcome back to The Body Surf. I'm James. I'm Jonathan. I have no idea how to begin this episode because something huge happened just moments ago. You simply state Novak Djokovic was defaulted at the US Open on Sunday, September 6th, roughly around 4.15 p.m. And the reason being is that he hit a ball toward the back of the court after losing serve that hit a lines person in the throat. Yes, that's that's the news lead. So it just happened very recently. I don't know what there is to say about it right now uh, because the situation was rather cut and dry. The deliberation with the tournament referee, I think lasted about five minutes and it seemed clear that there was only one decision to be made. The rules are quite clear about ball abuse, especially if someone on the court is struck, no matter how serious or no matter the intention. You say there isn't much to say, but if you fill in the context, there's quite a bit that can be said. One being that Djokovic has a history of doing this kind of thing. And by this kind of thing, I don't mean angrily trying to take out lines people and cameramen intentionally. He has a history of being careless with how he hits the ball around the tennis court in between points. Right. And there's been a couple famous, well, three infamous incidents in history with Nalbandian, with Tim Henman, and uh, also the most recent Denis Shapovalov in Davis Cup, where he almost blinded the chair umpire. Novak hasn't had this happen to him in the past when, quite frankly, to most onlookers, I'm sure even a lot of his fans, they would have been worried that something like this could potentially happen in the future. And in fact, it could have happened in the previous game. What seemed like a run-of-the-mill first set, Djokovic had triple set point with Karenio Busta serving at 4-5. Karenio Busta hit a ball that was called out. Djokovic then would have won the first set. Pablo challenged. The ball was then shown to be in. 15-40. Karenio Busta saves the next two set points. After one of them, Djokovic smashes in real earnest a ball into the sideboard. And James Blake comments then, this just minutes before the eventual default would happen, that Djokovic is lucky that the trajectory of that ball was not a little bit higher because it could have hit a cameraman. This is the, the, the great danger when these things happen on a tennis court, right? What if? There are a lot of what ifs. And if that what if comes to fruition, somebody can get hurt. In this case, the following game after Djokovic had to take a an injury timeout to tend to his shoulder after he fell in the five all game. Karenio Busta is now set to serve for the set at 6-5, and Djokovic, without looking to the back of the court, hits the ball to the backstop. And as soon as he hits it, he realizes that, well damn, this is going in the direction of somebody, potentially. And before we know it, it's struck the lines judge in her throat. Right. She shrieks and she goes down to the ground. And if you've ever been hit in your neck, like in your windpipe area, it takes very little impact for it to hurt or to feel uh, very disorienting. So James Blake was trying to explain to his commentating partners that Djokovic was unlucky in this moment that it hit someone. But in other situations, a player is very lucky if the ball doesn't hit someone. They make the same exact motion with the same exact intent which is not an intent to hit people, but one to let off frustration or whatever. But every time you do that and you don't strike someone, you are lucky. Not only Novak, but many players have been let off the hook for too long. So here is the problem that umpires have for a long time looked at this behavior and not sanctioned it severely enough from many players. Just at the Western and Southern Open, we were shown footage of Aliage Bedene hitting a ball to the backstop. He was facing the backstop, the back of the court, and the ball went over the back of the court and struck a cameraman. 
And the cameraman immediately diffused it and was like, oh, no, 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 it's no big deal. He didn't mean it, whatever. And the chair umpire, after having spoken to the cameraman, was like, okay, let's let's move on. Right. In the 4-5 game, when Djokovic hit that ball hard to the side of the court, I was sitting there waiting to hear the code violation or the warning, and nothing came. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't understand how an umpire could see that and not take action right and that's what i mean this has happened many times with many players that that kind of outburst is is ignored for whatever reason uh, based on a judgment call uh but once you hit someone that discipline has to rise to the highest level and it does right so it's just an accident of oh well there was a person in the way the time i did that i did the same exact thing but there happened to be a person there this time so i lose everything Mm -hmm. lose all my points i'm thrown out of this tournament Right, in an instant. We are not the rules are the rules kind of people. But... But, but if there is one, this is one. Yes. Uh, the, you know, the health and safety of people who work on the court is paramount. And uh, those folks are certainly not paid well enough to be abused by players. Abuse the racket. Smash the racket. Have at it. Break it, break it into 15 pieces. Take the violation and, and move on. I should, can I go back and just correct something? Nobody gets paid enough to be abused by anyone. I want to make that very clear. There's no amount of money that makes it okay. Uh, Just in case that was not clear. So this literally just happened. We haven't heard from Novak in press. We haven't heard from Pablo Carreño Busta, who is now into the quarterfinals of the US Open, a tournament that he's previously made the semifinals of. It it happened so quickly, and I'm sure there's going to be some fallout, a lot of talk. You won't be getting that from us because right. we have already recorded and, and said our bit. Chris McKendry was on ESPN reading and rereading the Grand Slam rulebook for anyone <laughs> who wants to hear it. Uh, but you can actually Google Grand Slam rulebook and get a PDF yourself under in, the abuse of balls category. It's there. In that setup, Renee Stubbs was on set with Brad Gilbert in the middle and then Chris McKendry. And Brad, for whatever reason went to great lengths to to do a lot of whataboutisms. Mm-hmm. It was like a lot of poking holes. It's not that Brad had a clear argument, but it was just a lot of, well, what about this? And, well, he didn't mean to do it, so da 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 And it was incoherent. He kept coming back to, yes, he should have been defaulted, but then there are all these whatabouts. Mm-hmm. And Renee Stubbs was simply not having it. She very clearly articulated the rules and why this conversation doesn't really need to be happening. They came from back from break and he starts talking about how we didn't even have lines people on the court in Cincinnati. And I don't, I don't want to put together the pieces of where that argument is trying to go. While the incident was happening, Cliff Drysdale was beside himself trying to let everybody know that Novak did not intend to do this and that that should factor into whether he's defaulted or not. Nobody's questioning (laughs) Whether Novak Djokovic wanted to hit this lineswoman in the throat. We, we know. You'd have he to be not. some kind of psychotic person for that to be your MO. Mm-hmm. James Blake, bless him, I don't know how many times he had to sit there and explain the exact same thing over again. That the intent does not matter. Whether or not there's malicious intent to hurt somebody does not matter in this instance. That it's an immediate default. Yeah. But what a metaphor for this year, right? That someone's actions, even the unintended actions, can have consequences that are much larger than oneself. When you say this year, are you referring to the world in general or Djokovic specifically? Right. I mean, you can fill in the meaning how you'd like. It, it's how, how Americans have handled the pandemic, how Djokovic has conducted himself over the past six months. It's a lot of things. Now, here we are in the second week of the U.S. Open, and for the first time in a long, long time, we're going to have a new men's Grand Slam champion. As of right now, with two round of 16 matches being played, there are 14 men who still have a chance of winning this title. And these 14 men, Karenio Busta, Shapovalov, Goffin, Chorich, Jordan Thompson, Zverev, Berrettini, Rublev, Tiafo, Medvedev, Pospisil, Diminar, Auger Alessim, and Dominic Team. This is this is kind of a crazy situation now. <laughs> yeah, I'm there you know, there are some names on there who 
everyone has been waiting for them to take the next step, like Dominic Team, Medvedev, Zverev, no one would be surprised to see any of those men become a Grand Slam champion. Those are the three for whom the opportunity is probably most pressing. Mm -hmm. You've been knocking on the door for a while. You've had this spotlight, this pressure to to be the person. Who is going to be the next person to finally break through on the ATP Tour? And this is squarely your chance. For me, it's it's, uh, Team and Medvedev who have the biggest spotlight on them now. Medvedev being the, the finalist last year. And then Dominic Team, who's made multiple Grand Slam finals. But for me, and not to put too much pressure on this person, but from what I've seen in the first week, should he get by Dominic Team tomorrow? I think this is Felix's tournament to win. What? I do. Out of I, all of those names? I do. I think it's the perfect opportunity for him to arrive. I think his game is just next level. Like, it's it's like when Federer broke through. You know, that's that's what I think it, oh, it let's could be. Not. I'm not saying that he's going to be Federer. I'm just saying that there's a moment where super young, talented prodigies have that, well, I'm, I'm a full-grown men's tennis player now. Mm-hmm. And, and I think this could be the moment for Felix. He said something in his Encore interview yesterday about uh, challenging himself to make his mental side rise to the level of his physical gifts. And physical gifts was was his his words, um, but he challenged himself to step up. Similar to how Francis Tiafo said in his interview, he decided to tap the fuck in. You know, like they're going forward with a similar mentality at the moment. Felix has had these incredible athletic gifts for years, and of course he's been growing into his body physically. But it seems like those mental hiccups, that lack of confidence in key moments he's he's really starting to work on and it's i mean his match against andy murray was most impressive folks want to say that andy murray was not there all physically in that match and that contributed to felix's performance i rebuke that because what i saw in that court was was a master class i've never seen felix play that well the power that he has on every single shot the finesse that he has he can do everything on a tennis court and make it look so easy. Mm. I mean, both can be true, right? We we can say that Andy Murray was diminished physically and not let that take away from Felix's performance. Because you know who Andy Murray is. Even if he is at 50%, he is going to fight you the whole time. Okay. Does Andy's limitations stop him from earning even one break point on Felix's serve <laughs> over three sets? I, I don't know. I don't know. Initially, we were going to do the the draw analysis of what's left a little bit later in the show. But with this news of Djokovic and then the subsequent fallout, we're going to move that up now to deal with the men's draw and what's left of it. And then deal with the women's draw later on as it comes up organically, hopefully. Mm-hmm. The Listen, the first week I felt was short on truly exciting matches, ex- save for a few notable exceptions. One of them is Chorich Tsitsipas. Tsitsipas is somebody I had personally slated into the semifinals and gave him a really good shot against Novak. And uh, obviously, neither of them got there, much to my surprise. And for Tsitsipas, what you saw was a complete collapse in that fourth set. He Uh, was a (laughs) 5-1 in that fourth set, serving for the match, serving for a 6-1 fourth set win. Gets broken, okay, it's now 5-2, then it's 5-3, Chorich climbs back to 5-3, Tsitsipas gets broken again, Chorich holds for 5-all, and then Tsitsipas is broken again, and loses a set 7-5. Chorich wins six games in a row against Tsitsipas, who up until that point at 5-1 had looked impregnable in the fourth set. That's not an overstatement. Mm -hmm. He was playing superb tennis. And I think earlier in the week we had seen a lot of creative tennis from him his returns have gotten a lot better i i just expected him to take his slot in the semifinals without a whole lot of drama and because borna george has not really been his best self for a while i mean he (laughs) suffered from covid19 well i I mean before that (laughs) yes but a few of the young men who tested positive for covid19 made the second week 
at this point in George's career, he's seen as someone with a lot of talent who does a lot of things well, a lot of things stylishly, but doesn't have necessarily the huge weapons or any huge weapon to really make that dent over seven matches at a Grand Slam against the top players. Right, right. But, you know, the generous view is that he was able to save six match points against the number four seed. The, I think, more correct view is that Tsitsipas lost a a bunch of those match points on inexplicable errors. He lost the plot. Yeah. And he seemed to blame his dad. For some reason, Tsitsipas' father left where he was sitting when he was going to serve for the match the first time. And then or, he, or some point when he was up big right. in the fourth set. And then he came back to his seat, and the psychodrama that entailed afterwards was just... It was a lot. A lot of screaming. The guys were yelling in each other's general direction. Stefanos yelling at his dad. The match really had everything. <laughs> because not only did you have that father-son, coach-pupil dynamic there, mind you, failing to close that out is squarely on Stefanos. Like, that's a projection. Mm. I don't know yeah. what's going on there. We know that there's a history. But then within the match, Borna and Stefanos, as you said, they were trading jabs at each other across the net, screaming in each other's faces. By the time you got to the fifth set, all the commentators were expecting Stefanos to go away, but he didn't. What we saw in that fifth set was high-quality stuff. Yeah. They eventually took it to a, a fifth set tie break, and Stefanos hit two of the three double faults he had the entire match in that tie break. Did not play the sound tight tennis that he needed to in that tie break, and Borna won. Mm-hmm. Two, I mean, two double faults in that final tie break. Brad Gilbert did predict uh, a bagel fifth set in Chorich's favor, or 6 1, but Stefanos kept it super close. Up until the end, he hiccuped. I think you've done a disservice to the men's side by saying it's been boring or not super interesting. No, I, I don't I, think I'm talking about the whole tournament. I disagree in so far as for the men, I don't see this as a departure from any other first week oh, of a Grand okay. Slam. Okay. And I'm actually kind of surprised that the the quality of play and the level of play has been higher than I expected. I'm actually I'm relieved that we haven't seen a whole host of retirements and walkovers. Very relieved about that. It seems like most of the people who came here to play are healthy. They've been keeping in shape. We've seen a lot of comebacks from two sets to one down, from a few from two sets to love down. Andy Murray did it. Karen Hachanov did it. I don't think that that's to be expected. Like the the sort of mental fortitude it takes to get back into big match play. That's not surprising. Can we talk about the three Canadian players into the second week of a Grand Slam for the first time? And Milo Raonic is not one of them? No. Uh, at the start of this tournament, if you had given someone that stat and told them to, to bet $5,000 on one player who that would be, you'd probably have gone with Milos. Mm-hmm. Based on his performance last week, how he played in the Australian Open in January, but he was taken out in the second round by his countrymen and the PTPA co-president, Vasek Pospisil. Vasek's result is surprising, but at the same time, not. Prior to lockdown, he had been having a lot of good results on the Challenger or ITF circuit, on the lower levels. He was doing really well, and he had started to to bring his game and his ranking up. Mm -hmm. He didn't come out of the blue. I also think he's feeling himself right now. I think he is clearly someone who is buoyed by being active and or successful in other areas. So with his Players Association, with Tennis United hosting gig, I think he's really feeling it. Like, he's confident. With Justin Gimmelstab no longer in tennis, I think it's safe to say that we have a new hardest working man in tennis. You really had to bring up that name. Well, I'm just saying that it it seems that with all the hats that he wears now, that he is a very hardworking fellow. And that that description could be used for him. In an article, like it was for Justin. Oh, okay. Like James Brown, the hardest working man in show business. There we go. Mm -hmm. Vashek is also selling a mushroom dietary supplement. Have you seen this? I have not. So he, after one of his matches, he turned to the camera and showed the can to the camera. And people were like, but Dominic couldn't bring a Red Bull can onto the court. Interesting. I don't pretend to know what the rules are 
about branding and all that stuff. But Dominic was very upset because he had a Red Bull can, which endorses him, and they wouldn't let him bring the can on court. It had to be poured into a cup. He said, fuck this shit. He did, No, he said, what the hell? <laughs> I think we are now at the point with Dominic team where we are in high alert for the bullshit. And so when he is going off, you're like, this is this is just not a good look. That's the mm. immediate impulse. But I do get his point here. His delivery. Well, his point was that... Hey, wait, wait, wait. His delivery, you could take issue with. His tone, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the snideness aside, his point was, you guys are, you know, super on top of doping controls. And I'm held to all these standards. Why would I let you take my drink off-site where I can't see what's being put in it? Yeah, that's actually an excellent point. But also, I was kind of like, just, dude, calm down. Oh, my God. I guess in a, you know, in a similar way that a player like Stefanos lets out a lot of steam by screaming at his dad. Like, players have different ways. Players have different outlets. Maybe this was Dominic's outlet in that moment. Also... This person is an officer of the tournament in some way. This is not somebody that you probably know very well. Mm. Somebody just doing their job. In front of cameras to be speaking to somebody like that? Uh, <laughs> it just, um, it isn't how I would necessarily do it. But then again, I'm not a professional tennis player playing at the highest level. So, right. what do I know? Vashek beat Milos. The next surprising result was that he beat RBA, Bautista Agut, who is... Such a superstar on hard courts. I was very surprised by this result. Especially since Pospisil had just come off that tough win against Milos. Perhaps he could have suffered a bit of a letdown being down two sets to one against somebody with this hard court pedigree. It was quite something. And to... he was getting medical treatment in both matches. Uh -huh. It was quite something to come back and win those last two sets. And so now Pospisil plays Alex Diminar in the fourth round. That will happen tomorrow. Aforementioned Dominic team plays Felix Auger Aliasim. Dominic came into the US Open after losing his first match in Cincinnati. After playing 28 exhibitions all around Europe during quarantine, he had the most match play coming in to Cincinnati. Mm. Did not play well there. He's been okay. Okay to good in, in New York so far. Francis Tiafo plays Daniel Medvedev in the fourth round. On paper, you think that Francis has no chance here. But this is not Francis getting into a second or third or fourth round after having played 72 hours in the previous rounds. You're used to Francis playing these long, drawn-out, four-set, five-set matches. This time around, he's able to get get through Fucevic in straight sets, 6-2, 6-3, 6-2. He did play five sets against John Millman. That but, wasn't necessarily ideal. But everybody does. And then he got through Seppi in four sets. Mm-hmm. You've skipped over uh, the other, the third Canadian. We were talking about the Canadians oh, the in the Canadian, second week. Sorry. Denis Shapovalov, to no one's surprise, is one of those players beating Taylor Fritz in the third round in five sets after coming from behind. Taylor Fritz is still looking for that first fourth round at a slam. It. We were just informed that Taylor ha was divorced in December. Well, he's 22 years old. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is the first that I'm hearing it. And apparently the first time a lot of other folks heard about it, he, so when you're uh, saying, he was profiled in Interview Magazine and they talked about it. So when you were saying that you were surprised by this, you were surprised that you hadn't heard about it, not that it actually happened. Right. Because to get married and have a child at 19, uh, to then be divorced by 22. It doesn't, it doesn't surprise me either way. Like, no judgment, it's just not, you Okay. Know, it's like, oh, okay. I'm going to let you continue because you keep wanting to talk about Shapovalov and... I'm, I'm stopping you from doing Well, it. we said Canadians and you've interrupted me about 12 times. I thought we were going through the draw and where we are in a kind of sensical way. Like a linear way? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is sensical a word? Yeah. Okay. It was not used correctly, but it is a word. Well, how is it supposed to be used? Um, to talk about something that has sense. It was used correctly. You just don't think I'm using any sense. Correct. So you told him uh, yourself. So Shapovalov plays Gonfin today. We'll know the result uh, before this episode comes out. Dennis is also part of a very good doubles team this week. He's playing doubles with Rohan Bopana, who is 40 years old now. They're in the quarterfinals of a, a smaller draw than usual. Uh, they beat number six, Kravitz and Mies in the second round. So back to the draw in the order in which you'd like to go. I hope you're able to follow at home. 
Rublev plays Berrettini. Both these men going pretty much under the radar at this tournament. Would not be surprising to see either of them win at this point. We are big fans of Rublev in this household. Zverev got through Davidovich Fokina in the fourth round in straight sets, easily 6-2, 6-2, 6-1. He will play the winner of George and Jordan Thompson. Now, George, having survived Tsitsipas and being given a new lease on life in this tournament, you would think conventional wisdom that coming off of that playing a fourth round match, you'd be met with some super tough opponent that would be kind of dispiriting to him. You know, but like, this is very winnable for George in the fourth round. Mm -hmm. Do you want to pick a champion? I already did. Oh. I picked Felix. Oh man, I'm going to pick Medvedev. Okay. We're just kind of winging it. This is one, the, the Djokovic thing has just thrown our agenda into disarray, Right. frankly. I, we actually have an agenda written very clearly and uh, we're having trouble. We're going to do the woman now. The woman's draw. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. Okay. <laughs> Currently, the t- I forgot that the TV was still on, and uh, we hadn't been paying attention to this match since the first set, and it appears that Shelby Rogers is serving to send her match against Petra Kvitova into a third set tiebreak. Mm-hmm. Apparently, she has saved a few match points already. It's 30-all, Rogers serving. Their only previous meeting, Shelby Rogers won 6-love, six 6-7, six six love <laughs> That was a couple years ago. Shelby Rogers is resurgent. If you recall, she was off tour for a year after having knee surgery in 2018, came back at Charleston in 2019, and has been slowly making her way, steadily making her way back up the rankings. This would be her second career slam quarterfinal, and she'd be within striking distance of her previous career high ranking. So she's well and truly back. I remember the last time I was in Charleston in 2018, Shelby was there... But she was just doing, essentially, hometown press, uh, supporting the tournament, not being part of the field. And uh, we are headed to a third set tiebreak. Right. Shelby beat Serena Williams a few weeks ago in Lexington. She took out the number 11 seed here, Elena Rybakina, then Madison Brangle. And here we are. What we're seeing at this tournament is a lot of strong results from the American players on the women's side. Not entirely surprising. No, because they don't have the, you know, that is that stress of international travel. There have been more Americans given wild cards because, well, the wild card system is unfair in general. But even more so, it was restricted this year because of the pandemic. That said, Jennifer Brady, who won Lexington, she bossed her way into the quarterfinals today. She is showing incredible form. Kennan is still around in the draw. Serena Williams is still around in the draw. Madison Keys was in the third round, so too Sloane Stevens. We had a few young Americans do well at this tournament. Katrina Scott, Anne Lee, she made the third round. She took out Allison Risk, 6-love, 6-3. What a moment for her. Yeah, that was a head-scratcher. Robin Montgomery made her not only Grand Slam main draw debut, but her WTA main draw debut. Somebody with prodigious talent. And also Haley Baptiste was in this field. Another not-so-young American, Madison Brengel, who lost to Rogers in the third round. Before that, she beat Diana Yastrzemska in the second round. That was another shocker. Jessica Bagula, one of the American players with a lot of form coming into this tournament, had the misfortune of playing Petra Kvitova in the third round, going out 6-4, 6-3 in a highly competitive match. Let's talk about Svetlana Pironkova, who... Uh, I thought had retired. She had a child early in 2018 and hadn't been on tour since 2017. You may know her as one of the great giant killers of her generation, of really the past 10, 15 years. She's beaten Venus Williams twice at majors, once at the Australian Open in 2006, I remember that one very clearly, and once at Wimbledon. Pirankova was seen as kind of a grass court specialist. She left the tour to have a child. She's one of the many mothers in the field, and I'm sure if you had been told that there was an unranked mother in the fourth round causing ruckus in the draw, you'd have assumed it would have been Kim Clijsters. But it's Pirankova. And it's incredible what she's done, frankly. She hasn't played a main draw event since 2017. This is her very first tournament back, (laughs) playing on a, a protected ranking. So she beats Muguruza in the second round. 
Dona Vekic in the third, and will now face Cornet for a spot in the quarterfinals. And let's give a little shout out to Alizé Cornet. She is now the active player with the most consecutive majors played. That's huge. 54 slams in a row she's played. Think about the consistency, the uh, ability to remain uninjured over that many years. Sources are telling me that's about 13 years. Sources. I've done. The, I've attempted to do the math. It's a long ass time. Well, 56 divided by four is how you is, get to that. Well, I don't know what that is. So that's 14 years. Okay. Four times one is four, and then four, four, sixteen. That's not how 40 I got there. 40 plus 16, 56. Okay. Nobody's interested in how you do mental math. <laughs> I'm so mad at myself, frankly, because on our preview episode, I really wanted to say that Cornet is somebody who could do very well at this tournament. I would have looked like an oracle. I'd have looked very smart. And instead, it's a, it's an opportunity missed for me. <laughs> she took advantage of this little spot in the draw where Jill Teichman was an extremely dangerous floater. But Bolsova is the one who came through. She's uh, Alizé has been playing well, but she also got a retirement mid-match against Madison Keys yesterday. And uh, to be fair, Alizé was out playing Miss Keys before that. But still, Madison had been mowing through her opponents up until that point mm-hmm. and was hampered by a neck injury. So yes, a bit of a bit of good fortune, but she's there. She's always seemingly there or thereabouts, and this right. could be an opportunity to to make a big dent in this tournament i said on the previous episode that one player who you could expect to not win a match at this tournament was angelique kerber and she won three (laughs) before eventually going out today to jennifer brady what are a few of the the highlight matches that happened in the first week perhaps a surprise carolina pliskova not so much that she lost because she did not play well in cincinnati she was the number one seed she plays caroline garcia in the second round, and gets beaten 6-1, 7-6. Yeah, that was a surprise. Another pleasant surprise is Victoria Azarenka, who's coming off that title in Cincinnati. And now, I mean, I, I think she should run us a check for being so wrong that it could have galvanized her. Because she really is looking a bit like the Vika of old. You think that we have that power? <laughs> It's really my only way of saving face after being so incorrect because she was just, she just didn't show you anything in Lexington and came to Cincinnati as a different player and has continued that. She was blitzed by Venus Williams in Lexington and then she goes to New York, plays the Cincinnati tournament. Can you imagine the, if you were listening to this five months ago, mm. six months ago, and you hear us say, she went to New York to play the Cincinnati right. tournament. You'd be like, what are you talking about? Like, are you okay? She gets to Cincinnati in New York. <laughs> she beats Vekic, Garcia, Cornet, Jabur, Kanta in the semifinals, and then wins the tournament with a walkover from Naomi Osaka. So there's that. She gets the big title, her first big title since 2016. And then she gets to the U.S. Open, continues her streak, beating Haas, Sabalenka, 6-1, 6-3, Mm-hmm. And then, just just made her countrywoman look totally out of sorts. And then beats Iga Sviantek in the third round. All told, eight wins thus far in New York across both tournaments, winning 16 sets and losing only one set to Johanna Conta in the semifinals of Cincinnati. As I say that, Petra Kvitova is serving with her fourth match point at 6-5 in the tiebreak. Do you want to give them a little taste of live body serve commentary? Second serve... That looks like a let because the the sound is off. <laughs> You're not into this at all. No. You're like, I do not want to do this. James Kiathavong is in the chair. Petra is gritting her teeth. And a double fault. Match point number four saved. Petra is beside herself. <laughs> and it's six all in the third set tiebreak as they switch ends. All right. So back to Vika. Shiantek was not playing bad at all. Vika praised her quite a bit in her presser afterward, talking about how she likes how she, you know, carries herself on court, that she's going to have an amazing future, and this young woman can hit winners from almost anywhere on court. But from Cincinnati 2019, Vika had lost four matches in a row, and since Cincinnati, we're on a, what, eight-match streak? Nine, mm-hmm. Well, nine, counting the walkover in the final. She's going to play Carolina Mohova 
for a spot in the quarterfinals. You know, as well as Vika is playing, don't underestimate Mohova. She beat Venus in the first round, who wasn't playing badly again. Uh, Mohova was also down love four in the third set tiebreak against Kirstea and came back to win. This woman just has, she has like so many gifts in her game. So many gifts. And I'm going to interrupt you one more time as Shelby Rogers serves with her first match point at 7-6. First serve, and the return is long. (laughs) Shelby Rogers is into her second career quarterfinal at the U.S. Open. Wow. This is, this is mad. This is wild. Petra will be uh, ruining those four match points that she lost. Well, why don't we preview that top half then? Interesting, Mary Carrillo on this broadcast let us know that Shelby Rogers has been going to Mary Paris's weekly Zoom Bible study meetings. There is never a dull moment in tennis, is there? I mean, there's uh, always always something new to learn. And <laughs> some little tidbit. Like connections that you didn't predict or didn't expect. Can you imagine if somebody really wrote a behind-the-scenes tell-all. Not even just like salacious, like this person smacked that person, cussed this person out, but just interesting little tidbits that you just would never know. Yeah, um, we need Venus NV2 really (laughs) badly. Can you imagine? I mean, that was only about 20 years ago, but the access that journalists don't have now, even since then, what would I what would the Venus Envy be called in in 2020? Naomi Envy. Now that's not very uh clever. Uh, very uh, we'll think about it and get back to you. <laughs> but women's top half. So Rogers just beat Kvitova. She is going to play the winner of Osaka Contivate, which happens tonight. Naomi, she came in injured. She's had this thigh wrapped. She doesn't want to talk about it. Fair enough. She al- already fears that she said too much. Impressed. That said, her game looks good. It does. Save for in her first match, I believe, in the third set, her second serve didn't really top 80 miles an hour. It seemed like she wasn't pushing off on the second serve as much as she could. But she's been able to to get through it thus far. Right. Georgie could have been a very tricky opponent. Naomi won 6-1-6-2. Marta Kostyuk, who we know is a super talented youngster, gave Naomi a bit of trouble. Naomi dropped the second set in a tiebreak, launched her racket halfway across the court, displaying more anger than we're accustomed to from her. This has been a feature of this tournament, some intense racket breaks. Yes. Muguruza had one. She had Shapovalov a legendary. Shapovalov had one. Yeah. But I would say if Naomi didn't have that wrapping and we weren't tentative about the the injury concerns she is as as good as any a pick to win this tournament fine but listen in that top half you now have jennifer brady playing yulia putinseva in the quarterfinals you'd think on form jennifer brady wins that but as sloan stevens let us know if it's not one scam it's another (laughs) with (laughs) with yulia so you just never know what to expect it is a mental battle whenever you play her. God, today against Martic, Putinseva uh, took a medical timeout before Martic was going to serve. She disappeared after the second set. She likes to take breaks in the middle of a match. We know this. And she's been criticized over the years for some occasionally outrageous behavior. Martic stormed back and it looked like she was going to even the third set after being down 5-1. And then Martic herself took a medical timeout and that i mean that was all she wrote right she lost after that she had gotten it back to 5-4 took the timeout before yulia served and it she lost the game Mm. anyway but putinseva is the type of player who is going to capitalize if there there are any lapses if there are any holes in her draw she's gonna punch above her weight and i thought it was funny after the match i was like during the match i was thinking has has any of her opponents like ever tried to beat her up in the locker room? Because she carries on sometimes, and I would be mad. And then during her interview, I was just like, wow, this girl just seems so sweet. I was immediately disarmed. It was a completely different personality from the one on court. It was like that meme of the chihuahua, when the first picture, the dog is growling, and in the second one, it's smiling. That is not a comparison I was expecting, nor do I think it's a particularly nice one. No, I mean, I'm not 
trying to compare her to an animal. It just struck me as after the match was over and the histrionics were done, she actually seemed like a genuinely endearing person. The thing I will say about Yulia is we have this tendency to understate her ability on the tennis court. Mm -hmm. It's not like she's Sarah Arani out here. No. She's got sound ground strokes. She's got incredible touch. She can do many different things on a court. She can mix looping balls with flat shots. The mental trickery and wiggery that you refer to is not just with the timeouts and what some might deem gamesmanship, but also with her actual quality of play. She's a talented player. Yes. So if she's able to to stay focused <laughs> and execute, she's got a, she's got a, as good a chance as anybody, really. Unfortunately, she has to face Jennifer Brady, who is just on fire. You mentioned Brady just beat Kerber today. Kerber simply didn't have any answers for Brady. The forehand is firing. Her movement is great. It's not just her forehand. She's got <laughs> right. everything in the bag. Her backhand is incredible as well. She's got a great serve backhand and forehand, and her movement has improved so much. And she has the confidence to boot now. So that's the top half. On the bottom half, we could see Cornet or Peronkova in the quarters to face the winner of Serena and Sakari. I want to talk about Sloan Serena because that was a match that everyone was paying attention to yesterday. I You predicted it before the tournament that you felt that Sloan would probably get there. And if they both got to the third round, Sloan was going to be a problem. Yeah. And she was. You were very dismissive of Sloan to start the tournament. I was. And it wasn't without evidence, but it was all those intangibles that I ignored that you didn't. Right? I will take your praise just Mm -hmm. now. Sloan wants to be there to face Serena. And that first set was like, whoa. This is not, this is not a joke. This is not going to be any sort of easy match between them. Serena looked out of sorts. Sloane was playing well, but, you know, Sloane was doing what she had to do. She was getting balls back. She was hitting winners, but it wasn't anything that was going to kill just anyone out there, right? Serena wasn't moving the way she should have. She was making a lot of errors. But see, this is the danger with Sloane's game when she's playing well. She's not blowing you off the court. Yeah, and I think, you know, I do think I'm being a little unfair because the same way that... Uh, Some of the commentators are kind of tricked by Sloane's personality and her demeanor on court. They're tricked into thinking that she doesn't care. And I don't think that's it. Because people who know Sloane have said, like, that's just how she is. Sloane is just cool. She's chill. She She can kill you on the tennis court and look like she doesn't care. She obviously cares. She's ran for WTA Council, is doing a lot of work behind the scenes to better the working environment for her fellow players. Yeah. That's not the actions of somebody who doesn't care about tennis. Right. So I'll admit that I can be tricked by her sort of lackadaisical seeming Mm -hmm. uh, comportment on court. I loved her bucket hat that she wore in press. That was a highlight of week one. (laughs) It was so funny. So Sloan wins the first set. It looks bad, right? It looks like we're going to just have to accept that Sloan is winning this match And then something happened. Serena came out in the second set, held easily, which I think was really important mentally for her, is to just hold. And then she started chipping away at the Steven serve. She got a break, and Serena's game just started to click. She starts to hit these angles on the forehand that we weren't seeing in the first set. She was starting to get into position better. Her feet were moving more quickly. And, you know, after the first set, I had accepted she might lose. And that's going to have to be okay. But once the match started going into the third set and I felt like, you know, she looks like she's going to win this, I realized if you want to continue being a fan of Serena and not torture yourself, this has to be inspiring to you. Because we know we're not going to get excellence throughout an entire match from Serena at this age. She's 38.96 years old. But this turnaround, this mental regroup was it felt like that old Serena that we know, right? There's so many pieces that are still there. You just have to accept that she's not 2002 Serena or 2013 Serena. And it can still be an incredible joy as a fan. I'll let you have the mic on that. Okay. I'm not going to add more 
to that situation. I think uh, we will just have to wait and see how the rest of these two weeks play out. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was just on a high watching her think through that match and and relax herself and remind herself that, you know, if I do these things and I start to hit my ground strokes with more accuracy and get my feet in the right position, I can win this match. The biggest key is getting her feet in the right position. Yeah, it always is. You can make the argument that she's been surviving a lot of these matches upon her assumption with her serve, on the strength of her serve. Because a lot of times she's been caught out of a, out of position and lunging to balls or seeming like she's just half a step behind where she needs to be to be in position to hit the shot that she wants to hit. And, you know, that's a function of age. That's a function of rust. Can she get that back? Can she mm-hmm. do that more consistently? Is it a, well, I feel good this day. I have the rhythm this day, but not necessarily the next. We'll see how this progresses. Right. But I'm saying to my fellow fans, and any fans who are are great fans of older players, I think it's good for our mental health to learn to love who they are today. Yes. Uh, it's the same with being a Mariah fan. Her voice is not the same as it was in 1995. It is simply not, and it's never going to be. You have to love who she is now. And who she is now is pretty damn great. Exactly. And if you understand anything about Mariah's voice, you will know that it's still better than the majority of these women out there, as far as vocalists go. Look look what I started. No, but Serena is still better than the majority of these tennis players out there. That said, she will face her Cincinnati vanquisher, Maria Sakkari. That said, Serena, who's had trouble with closing out matches, suffered from that same plight against Sakkari in Cincinnati, Mm -hmm. leading in both sets being broken at the back end of those sets while she had the lead. Is this something that will recur? Is this something that she can overcome? It's definitely a thing at this point. Mm -hmm. But But it didn't hamper her in the Sloan match. No. My point is, when you say that Sakari was her conqueror, Sakari played well, but there were a lot of things that Serena did badly to lose that match. Say nothing about their set. Rounding out the bottom half here... As we said, we have Azarenka Mukhova for a spot in the quarterfinals, and Mertens and Kennan. So Kennan is the only slam winner so far this year. She is making her way through this draw very quietly. She's watching a ton of tennis. Completely under the radar, being efficient and just sitting in the stands, taking it all in. Mm-hmm. She did not hit many winners at all against Ans Shabur. Gets through that match in straight sets. Jabour could have been an extremely difficult opponent. You know, you could have seen her in the semis here. She's beaten Wickmeyer, Leila Fernandez, Anz Jabour. Now she'll play Elisa Mertens. All right. Do you want to... Do you, do you have a winner? <sighs> this is a tough one. I don't have a winner. I really don't. It could be any number... I'll give you... I'll give you five people that, who it could be, come on. and it's going to be one of those people. Then let me give my one, and then you can give your okay. five. My winner is Jennifer Brady. Okay. I'm worried about Naomi's thigh. If she's healthy enough to get through the seven matches, I think Naomi is the winner. If not, then I'm going to go with, with Vika. I think mm. she is on a mission. She, she leaves the court after beating Sviantek and goes immediately to the practice court to work on her second serve. Girl, that's... Like, when you are starved for form, when you are starved for results, when you have all the haters out here, like us, and so many people telling you that you are done, you are a shadow of the person that you were before, when you've gone through the things that she's gone through off the court, and you've managed to climb back up the mountain, and you have this momentum and this peace and this just will and drive... That momentum, once recaptured by a champion of her ilk, could be insurmountable. In keeping with this being kind of a makeshift episode for us in terms of following an agenda, we are actually back from a break. We we recorded this first bit and then we did a Zoom call with my parents, Mm -hmm. a weekly Sunday Zoom call, and now we're back to record the last bit of this episode. Denis Shapovalov is now on court against Debbie Goffin. And Borna Chorich is playing Thompson. A set and a break up on Thompson. The the bubble, the quarantine, the double bubble, all that was 
up to this point, the biggest story of week one until the Djokovic default. Up until a couple days ago, I thought this was going to be a pretty run-of-the-mill, easy-breezy, mid-US Open episode. And then the last couple mm. days, all hell broke loose. Right. Uh, two days before the tournament started, Benoit Paire tests positive for COVID-19, which you've heard by now. And it set into motion these plans. You know, those of us sitting at home couldn't tell how it was going to go. If there were people who had been close to him, it would follow that there would be several other positive tests resulting from it. There haven't been so far, but what happened was that they identified a group of 11, including Benoit, who would be subject to stricter restrictions going forward. And we were here trying to do our own kind of contact tracing while Nicola Mau is in this, I guess, lesser bubble, but he was out here practicing with Serena Williams. Right. Like, who are the people who have had any kind of contact with this largely French contingent? Right. The USDA wasn't particularly forthcoming about this. Cracked Rackets and Ben Rothenberg, I think, were the first people to break the the new regulations of the new bubble. And then there was a, a follow-up New York Times piece that explained it all in detail. But basically, three players were identified and put in sort of, let's call it uh, an enhanced bubble, like the 1.5 bubble. It was It was bizarre because... Benoit Paire's name had been revealed by so many people Mm -hmm. as being the person who had tested positive. And the USTA is issuing this statement protecting his privacy, I guess. Not naming him. From the start, they've been behind the ball in being transparent about this, this issue. And I guess you could make the argument that they're doing this delicate balancing act between protecting players' privacy and being forthcoming about what's going on with the tournament. But... Like, this is moving so fast that you make yourself look so amateur when you, you take this approach. Right. So the three players were Medvedev, Mahu, and Jumar. And so they were allowed to move around freely, but they were subject to daily testing. This is the little bubble. This is the 1.5 bubble. So the double bubble, the, the real serious one, were people who had close contact with Benoit. There were seven players named... Kiki Madanovic, Gasquet, Flipkins, Manorino, I believe it was five French and two Belgian players in the double bubble. And that was considerably more stringent. They were subject to daily testing like the others, but they had no access to common areas in both the hotel and the site. They They, had to take the stairs instead of the elevator. Yeah, no gyms. They couldn't wander around. It was very restrictive. When they get back to the hotel, they were confined to their rooms and their credentials were actually confiscated once they reached the hotel so they they couldn't move around. An interesting fact about this contact tracing that was done is that it was electronic. So they were Mm -hmm. able to judge who exactly was in close contact with Benoit Pair. They were able to to take it back and and find out that the main vector event was the card game. Yes. Because all these players... And their electronic credentialing were congregated around this card table. Mm -hmm. So this card game will become rather important in a few moments. (laughs) All the players affected within those, you know, those 10 people had to sign a new agreement with the tournament that they would abide by the new regulations. And what we didn't know is that there was going to be a whole lot of sort of jostling between different levels of government and different health departments over how these rules were to be enacted. Kiki Mladenovic, earlier in the week, is up 6-1, 5-1, 15 love on her serve, had four match points the following game, and loses this match. This is against Varvara Gracheva, you know, a player that she was poised to beat quite easily. This after she let out an almighty scream in the microphone after winning her first round match. She was pumped to be there and to be doing well. So after the match... Kiki, uh, I mean, she she let it all out. To she kind of had a fit. To be clear, this is an, kind of an all-timer as far as a collapse. There have been other instances with higher stakes, for sure. But this was, this was not good for her. No. She said in press afterward, If I had known that playing cards for 40 minutes with a mask with a player who tested positive and ultimately negative would have these consequences, I would never have set foot in this tournament. I'll go on, but I'll comment about this after. She also said, I have the impression we are prisoners or criminals. 
For even the slightest movement, we have to ask permission, even though we are tested every day and have had 37 negatives. It's abominable. The conditions are atrocious. Okay, let's start with the if I had known. She was clearly in her feelings after this loss. She was, because uh, this this person who said this surely could not have been thinking clearly. I wonder if she could have said it in a in a different way that would have been less of a problem in one of her other 24 languages. Or one of the many social media posts she made following these comments. Because she definitely walked it back a little bit with her Twitter post a couple hours later. Mm -hmm. So she said that if I played cards with a player who was positive for COVID-19 and I would be subject to these consequences, I wouldn't have come here. Well, you did know. I, I mean, that's pretty clear that for anyone who's been alive during this pandemic over the past six months, isn't that a fairly ridiculous statement? If you were in the same room with someone who was positive, obviously there are going to be serious restrictions to where you can and cannot go. That's that's obvious to all If of us. we go out to dinner and somebody we're with has tested positive, we are staying or as his home, not leaving to even go get some fresh air, not even opening the window to let some of that potential COVID out. The because window. we are concerned about protecting other people. Right, but even if you're not concerned, you do not have a choice because I'm sure you were told that th these are the rules before you get here. Otherwise, the, the like, point is it's common sense. But like, what, what were you expecting? A lot of players decided not to play this tournament for many different reasons. Also, and I know this is beside the point and kind of snarky, but truly, who in their right mind would think it a good idea to go play cards with Benoit Paire under these circumstances during a pandemic at the U.S. Open? Like, I'm not even going to say no shade to Benoit, like all shade to Benoit. <laughs> like, he is not... Like, the first part of quarantine, he was sipping cocktails on the beach, I believe, in Mexico every day. Mm. While people were <laughs> hunkering down, like, that whole adage of you are the company you keep, like, I, mm. I, I just don't I know. don't know. And I mean, I don't think we even have to comment on the prisoners or criminals comments. It's abominable. The conditions are atrocious. Okay, we get it. You're upset. And, you know, I'm like, I'm trying to be understanding because these are not typical conditions it i'm sure it is very psychologically difficult to be confined in that way uh, i will give her that this is not normal but to go off like a lot of people around the world aren't suffering much worse because of the same thing it's just it's a lot it's a lot to take or that other people haven't been quarantined not just for two weeks but for months because right. they're being super cautious it is beyond tone deaf and let's be real you may think that there are all these restrictions but i guarantee you if there was anything that that kiki mladenovic needed brought to her hotel room she would have gotten it that is yes. not a luxury that you or i would have so her you know her brother posted this photo of where she was allowed to go and said is this normal and i was like no it's that's not, the point hell no it's not normal have where have you been these are not normal times. <laughs> right. Like, I know we talked about Bayin and Yastremska, like the drama that follows them. This is very on brand for these two, the sister and brother pair. Anyway, it starts to get weird uh, on Thursday when Manorino Zverev is delayed. Listen, I'm at work and I see all these people, you included, trying to figure out what's going on. And even more so, I have no idea what's going on. Right. I just closed Twitter and let it stay till I got home. I was like, catch me up because yeah. madness clearly happened. So uh, this match is delayed about three hours. It comes out. There's some very vague statements about there being possible political issues at play. And they're, they're waiting to hear something that's relating to this original 11. Pairs 11. It was so bizarre. So it now appears that New York State has caught wind of the positive test and they may be trying to impose different quarantine rules for the people who are in close contact with the positive case. Now, did Manorino slip in under the gun? Well, this is the thing. It, it's so murky. Like, first, you'd have thought that the U.S. Open would have had an ironclad way of dealing with this at the start of the tournament that this at least wouldn't have been forced, unforeseen for them. Maybe the players wouldn't have really understood the full extent of it, but why is this still 
a developing story. Right, because so few, so many days into the tournament, because like Benoit tested positive before the tournament started. Mm-hmm. Like you need to have these contingencies, these what would happen if so and so happens in your plan. So they scrambled to get this new set of rules for the people in the the extra bubble. But what they didn't anticipate, I guess, was that New York State and later Nassau County would follow their own health regulations, which was in opposition to what the USTA laid down. So Manorino, I suppose because he was already on site in Queens, the match was delayed, but it was allowed to go on. So he lost to Zverev. You know, Zverev was, was super professional about it. Because he could have been annoyed or whatever, and he was just like, I'm just glad that Adrian, you know, got to come on court. Like, he's a great player. But also, listen, we were told before this tournament that these health protocols were made in conjunction with state health officials. So what? So what happened? What happened? Like, did the governor catch wind of it? And- did they not get in touch with the right state officials? Did they not realize that they'd have to be dealing with local state officials as well? I mean, the government's in the United States of America, the many layers of them can be a little bit complicated for folks. Oh, yeah. I mean, well, I mean, it's complicated US... for me. Like, I grew up in New York State. <laughs> right, but the and... USTA is run by Americans. It's an American organization. Mm. You know, it's not like the French Federation doing business in America. I just find it right. so low rent. Okay. So for Kiki, it gets worse. On Saturday, the USTA announces early that Mladenovic Babos the number one seed in doubles will be withdrawn because of Kiki's prolonged contact with Benoit. Now this time, it's Nassau County, New York, who made the call. The spokesperson for Nassau County, which was quoted by the New York Times, said that they only just became aware of the positive test that happened, you know, about a week prior. And they're treating those people who are potentially exposed as they would anyone else in Nassau County that they have to quarantine in their hotel rooms until the end of the quarantine period, which is next Saturday, and that prevents them from leaving the hotel and driving to the National Tennis Center to play matches. So, like, this ratcheted up a lot in a day. So previously, it seemed that the USDA was dealing with the New York State government, but now Nassau County, on a county level, steps in. Is this how I'm to understand this? Well, and... And that would explain why Manorino, after lobbying from Djokovic and all these people on site was able to play his match on the Thursday, but then Kiki was not allowed to be in the draw on... Right, that part's unclear to me. Like, it's maybe because Manorino was already in Queens that he was allowed to play that day. You know, so now we have Nassau County controlling the hotel. The tennis center is in Queens County, which is part of the city of New York. And the health department's have uh, seemed to have different views on how this should be handled. And the USTA was sort of trying, was left holding the bag. So on, on Friday, when the Manorino thing was happening, Djokovic was appri- apparently trying to contact the governor's office all day. But the... That sounds like a joke, but it's not. It's not. No, I mean, uh, I'm not even being shady about that. Like, as the leader, the co-leader of this new Players Association, that's that's a good look for him, mm-hmm. right? To, to go to bat for a fellow player. But what's really problematic about this is that Djokovic and others are spreading this kind of fake news about a false positive with Benoit with absolutely no evidence. You know, nobody else has tested positive that we know of who had been in contact with Benoit, which is awesome, which is amazing. Great for the tournament. Right. And great for, you know, for everyone's health. That's great. Because this could have gone sideways even more and just ravaged the the field yes but i have to take issue with this this false positive language that he and mladenovic threw out there with no evidence false positives they do happen but they're rare and they're much much less common than false negatives but despite the uh the kind of bad pr kiki has been doing for herself i do really feel for her and tamea babosh they were the number one seeds they had an excellent chance to win this tournament and they had to issue a walkover to Dabrowski and Risk. And so I think the issue here is that there has been a, a lack of consistency in how the rules have been applied. And the lack of transparency has also created this sort of muddled view. And, and even if the rules have been applied as consistently as possible, the fact that we've been given very little news about it 
makes us perceive it as poorly handled. Um, it's also important to note that, and I guess I'm guilty of doing this even just a few minutes ago in this episode, a lot of what's happening with COVID, especially as it pertains to sports, is constantly changing. What you may think applies on Monday may not be the case on Thursday. It just appears that there was more homework that needed to be done in this situation. It also brings to mind this concern that a lot of the players, allegedly spearheaded by Djokovic, had with returning to Europe to play the French Open. As it turns out, Novak won't have to worry about that now. But they wanted assurance that they wouldn't have to quarantine upon returning to Europe ahead of these clay mm. events. And we wondered, like, how are the USTA and the French Federation going to swing this? How can they make that guarantee when these are decisions made by governments right. of actual countries? <laughs> you know? not, a, not a tennis federation. And it just goes to show that it's, it's not something you can guarantee. Because the US Open, the USTA thought they had this under control, mm. that they had guidelines in place and... You have all these local health departments now swooping in to, to rest control, full control, from the tournament. Right. The U.S. Open thought they had given these assurances to players that if you follow these rules, you will be fine and we'll let you play. And this Long Island County was like, not so fast. This is not how we would treat any other citizen of this county who was in close and prolonged contact with someone who tested positive. Players have brought up how Pela and Delian were treated in Cincinnati, and that, you know, that's a great argument. They were ejected immediately from the Cincinnati bubble. Why were these players treated differently? Where Mladenovic's argument kind of breaks down is that, yes, she's right that there's a lack of consistency in the rules, that the communication has been poor in some cases, but she's been arguing that the rules should be applied less strictly. Which cannot be the go-to in, in the middle of a pandemic. It's just, it's not going to work. No, right? and we cannot get ourselves to a place where athletes feel like they are the exemption and the exception. Because you are still having these events as much as you're told or feel that you are in a bubble within a city, within a state, within a country. The actions of this tournament have repercussions on the era in which it's placed. Mm. Like, the U.S. state is not its own government, right? And so... These players have to, unfortunately for them, be more nimble in how they react to changing situations. You're absolutely right to feel aggrieved that there's a haphazard application of the rules, that the rules change. But this is, this is where we are. I think we would all be well advised to remember that there are a lot of people at the tournament who are not players. Mm -hmm. right? There are a lot of people who, who simply work here and they go home to their families and... There's, you know, there's another thing that it's not really a bubble. <laughs> it isn't if, because we right? know now that the hotels are not closed off to just right. the players. But there's also, you know, people who work at the hotels and the people who drive you, like, are they all being bubbled? But, you know, we also have to think about the safety of just regular folks trying to do their job and get by. And they're just as important. Right. And so that's what's been lost and why I think the criticism of players being entitled and whiny is not unfair. Because there's a lot of woe is me when a lot of regular people are going through a whole lot worse. And, you know, a lot of the regular people they might come into contact with every day. It's not a great look to say, I feel we are prisoners and criminals. And another thing, should prisoners and criminals be treated poorly as well? Or right. I, like At the start of quarantine or when there was initial talk about the U.S. opening up, about states opening up, Sean Doolittle, a pitcher for the Washington Nationals, gave this now famous press conference where he said, well, listen, and I'm paraphrasing, sports are the reward of a functioning society. Nobody here is entitled to watch sport as much as you are a professional and this is your livelihood. You're not entitled to play sport in a pandemic when everybody else in society is struggling, is not able to go outside. You know what I mean? Like this is this is a an extra luxury, this US Open. We've argued, a lot of people have argued whether or not this should have even happened in the first place. We're here. The tournament is happening. 
but you don't get to then pretend or act that you are somehow more important. Do you know what I mean? Like that, that is the impression that is being given right now. Right. Or that we need to suspend the rules for you, be, you know, because you're different. Like you're a professional athlete. This is a luxury. And the thing is, like, if they tomorrow pull out everybody and say this tournament's canceled, we're just going to have to deal with it. As you know, a lot of this is still developing as we've been recording. And so we'll come back to the Djokovic default for a bit here. Because while we've been recording, we learned that Djokovic left the site. He was not going to be going to press. He subsequently issued a statement, quote, This whole situation has left me really sad and empty. I checked on the lines person and the tournament told me that thank God she's feeling okay. I'm extremely sorry to have caused her such stress. So unintended. So wrong. I'm not disclosing her name to respect her privacy. As for the disqualification, I need to go back within and work on my disappointment and turn this all into a lesson for my growth and evolution as a player and human being. I apologize to the US Open tournament and everyone associated for my behavior. I'm very grateful to my team and family for being my rock support and my fans for always being there with me. Thank you and I'm so sorry. As far as apologies go, that's a a pretty good one. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately for Novak, the internet and Twitter in particular, they just do not miss. They don't miss. If there's something in your history, they're going to bring it up. Yeah. And so there's this press conference that's circulating from a couple of years ago where Novak is asked about similar things that he did on court where potentially he could have harmed somebody if the ball hit them. And to say that Novak was glib and flippant and uh, responding poorly in that press conference would be an understatement. It's actually kind of gross. It was the tennis equivalent of this you. Yeah. You know, we've seen that all on Twitter all through this pandemic. People just get owned based on past mm-hmm. tweets or past behavior or whatever. But I'm not sure you were if people quite get the this you thing. It didn't really come across it. Oh. So, for example, if you are on Twitter, a good example would be during this whole Black Lives Matter movement, a lot of folks who are now, who are now performative in their support of anti-racist movements They'll tweet something with the hashtag and then somebody will quote tweet them with their tweet from like last year and be like, is this you? This you? And it's something really bad or racist that they say. This this video is incredible in the wake of what just happened. We said early in the show that this is not the first time that this has happened with Novak in terms of him doing something like this. It's the first time that someone's actually been hit, right? And the very first question that's asked in this clip is... The reporter asks, do you think this is something that in the future could cost you dearly? Novak laughs it off. He's pissed off by the question. Really, like, visibly angry by the question. He says, you guys are unbelievable. And very dismissive. and But he says, he admits, that this is not the first time I've done something like this. And the, it says, inc- I'm not the only one. But it's incredible how prescient that, that question was. He said, will this cost you one day dearly? And it has. Previously unbeaten on the season, now he's beaten himself. I think we have to wrap up there because mid slam, who has time for this? This is a longer episode than we anticipated, but thank you for listening. I'm James at Elliot JMR on Twitter. Two L's, two T's. I'm Jonathan at tennis underscore John. We are at the body serve on Twitter and Instagram, and you can find us on Spotify, Overcast, all those podcast apps. We'll be back in a week or so to give you the the final US Open episode. Who knows what will have happened by then. There's already a bunch of stuff we had to cut from this episode because of time. So much is unforeseen or unknown about the rest of the tennis season. We're just going to take it as it comes and hope that you join us for the ride. Till next time. Thank you very much.